Okay, so this is just going over some of the page three notes that you might have missed or might need some reinforcing on. And we're just starting by talking about what pressure is. So let's write this definition down by your word pressure there. Pressure is the force of particles pushing against each other and the walls of their container. And since molecules can't push with their hands, since they don't have any, they push against each other by colliding with each other and running into each other and the walls of their container. The key word there really, I think, is pushing. Pressure is a push. If I'm pressuring you to do something, I'm pushing you to do something. Um, so that pressure is just caused by molecules pushing against each other and pushing out against the walls of their container. And what you really need to be able to do is recognize when we have pressure units, because there's lots of different units for pressure. And I know that this table isn't in your notes, um, and you don't necessarily have to write it out. There is an example of each of these in your notes there um, with some numbers and stuff, but I don't want you to get too preoccupied about the numbers. I just want you to know what are the units for pressure and what, what do they mean. So this ATM unit is short for atmospheres. And you see there that the standard pressure is one atmosphere. So that's one atmosphere full of gas molecules pushing in on you. That's your standard pressure. It's a nice unit because the pressure is one and that makes calculations nice. But back in the day, before we were able to calculate pressure the way we do now, the ancient Greeks used this old-fashioned mercury barometer I mean, I guess it was the height of technology back then, not really old-fashioned, um, to measure pressure. And that's where these units came from. This MMHG that you see there stands for millimeters of mercury. MM is millimeters, HG is the chemical symbol for mercury. And what the ancient Greeks did is they just took a dish of mercury, like a bowl or a deep plate, and then they put this tube upside down. It's like a big test tube. And they put it upside down with the open end in the mercury and then the closed end is pointing up. And what happens is that the air is constantly pushing on every single thing on earth. That air pressure is molecules running into everything. And so that's also going to be running into the dish and that surface of the mercury. And the harder that that air pressure pushes down, so the higher the atmospheric pressure is, the more that mercury gets forced up into that tube. And so the ancient Greeks measured how many millimeters high that mercury was on any given day and could tell whether the atmospheric pressure was bigger or smaller that day based on whether the mercury went up or down. Says, I know pressure is weird to be measuring in millimeters, but that's how and where those came from. KPA stands for kilopascals, that is the standard international unit for pressure, so we're going to see that a lot. And then PSI is actually something we're not going to see much, except maybe in our everyday lives. That's something just the U.S. people use. PSI stands for pounds per square inch. And what it mentions on your table is that, or in that packet, sorry, um, not in the table, is that standard pressure is 14.7 PSI. So that means at any given point, every given point in time, um, while you're on the planet Earth, you have 14.7 pounds of pressure pushing in on every square inch of your body. So go find a 15-pound dumbbell sometime, pick it up. That's how much force is pushing in on every single part of your body every single moment of the day. The only reason you don't feel overwhelmed by that pressure is that your body also has things like blood pressure that's equalizing and balancing out that pressure from the inside. So you're not getting squished down into a little bitty ball. So these are our pressure units and where they came from. Um, you're not going to have to do any kind of pressure conversions. We just need to recognize that these are pressure units. So let's start talking about temperature. Temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy of the particles in a system. Um, and there's not really a place for you to write that definition, but I would recommend that you write it down. It's very similar to the fifth law, um, or the fifth part of the kinetic molecular theory that we wrote down last night. That told us that the kinetic energy is based on temperature and vice versa. Um, just remember, kinetic energy is speed. So temperature is really just measuring how fast, what the speed of the particles are. The faster they move, 
the more they're hitting each other, the more friction there is, and the more we would feel that as heat. The less quickly they move, the less they're hitting and rubbing, and less friction means less heat. So we observe temperature as hot or cold, but what's physically happening is the molecules moving faster or slower. Now, we're going to have to chain, do some temperature conversions. Um, not Fahrenheit to Celsius, thank goodness, that one's complicated. But we're going to be doing all of our calculations for gases in Kelvin. And Kelvin is just a special unit for temperature that has no negatives. Because we're going to be calculating things like pressure and volume, we can't have negative volumes. I don't know what a balloon with a negative 5 volume would look like, but um, I can't wrap my head around it. It can't exist. <laughs> no negative volumes, which must mean we can't have negative temperatures going into those equations. So this Kelvin guy just made up a new temperature scale, and he found what the absolute lowest possible temperature is, and he set that at zero. That's what we call absolute zero. You cannot get colder than absolute zero. And so because of that, all of the temperatures in Kelvin are going to be positive numbers. Now, your packet has this equation right over here, but if you look at your equation sheet, I'm not talking about the periodic table, but that other one, I'm going to pull mine up right here. Right here in the middle, you see this little equation? And <clears throat> even though it doesn't tell you what to add or subtract, we can use that in order to decide what to add and subtract in our uh, problems. So if we look at that equation, when we're trying to go from Celsius to Kelvin, which is what we're going to be doing most of the time, and we're going to mathematically do whatever we got to do to get from 0 to 273. And that means we're going to be adding that 273 number. When we're going from Kelvin to Celsius, we're going to do what we got to do to get from 273 to 0, and that's subtract 273. We're not going to do that very much. And most of the time, just in general, anywhere you see Celsius, we're going to change it to Kelvin and use that number. But if something does have you go backwards, specifically asks you for a temperature in Celsius, you'll have to do all your fancy calculations in Kelvin, get an answer out, and then subtract 273. But let's just practice some of these temperature conversions real quick. And I just put that equation that we need to be able to use on here. So in that first one, we're going from Celsius to Kelvin, 0 to 273. So I'm adding 273. And 25 plus 273 is 298. For number 2, I can do negative 40 plus 273. But if you're at home and you don't have a calculator that can do negatives or you forget how to find them on my calculators, then remember your algebra. You can also just do 273 minus 40. Those are going to be the same. And when we do that, that gives us a final Kelvin temperature of 233. Be careful on this third one. This one is going from Kelvin to Celsius, which is weird. We're not going to do it much. But that means we need to be subtracting 273, which gives us negative 73. We can't have negative Kelvin, but negative Celsius exists. Zero Celsius, going from Celsius to Kelvin, so I'm adding, and that's going to be 273. Zero Kelvin into Celsius is negative 273. And then 120 C Turning into Kelvin, I'm going to have to add that 273, and we get 393 Kelvin. So, we're going to need to do that. Honestly, you could probably flip through your packet right now, and anywhere that you see degrees Celsius, you can cross it out, turn it into Kelvin, and it would make your life easier once you get there. You would love that so much, but I understand you might not want to do that. So, you don't have to, but good practice. So, the last thing I want to mention in this podcast is actually standard temperature and pressure, which sometimes gets abbreviated as, as STP, and uh, you have all of those conditions written right there, but I want to remind you and point out that that is also on our equation sheet. It's actually in that same section right where we saw that uh, temperature conversion equation right above it. It tells us what standard temperature and pressure is, even reminds us that that's going to be abbreviated as STP a whole lot. But it only gives us the standard temperature in Celsius. So if I'm going to be using Kelvin, I have that little reminder right below there of how to change that into Kelvin. It also only gives me my standard pressure in atmospheres. But all the way down here, it tells us what all the rest 
of these conversions are. So we have that standard temperature and pressure right there for you. Um, you don't have to memorize it. We just need to recognize when we see those three magic letters, STP, then that means that we need to figure out what is our standard temperature and our standard pressure. So that's it for this top part of page three. Technically, then we went and we did our gas activity back in the back of the classroom. And then uh, we came back to do the last little bit of notes, and I'll record that in a separate podcast.